Hello, and welcome to the ninth episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Thursday the 21st of October 2021, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. We read Chapter 9, The Social Average, The Working Hour as the Basis of Consumption. This week, I have the new patrons, Emir and Apnik, to thank. If you like extra Patreon-only bonus episodes, creating Discord over on the Discord server, joining in the patron-only reading groups, or just want to support the good work I do, why not head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar? Okay, let's join the discussion. Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of the Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution Reading Group series. We just finished chapter eight last week where we we have our definition of how we calculate the price of an item, uh, a product in communism by at the guild level, all the averaging over all the factories to get the average amount of labor time taken to produce a commodity. So this is the equivalent concept, Marx's concept of the socially necessary labor time under capitalism. But the function of how it will work will be different due to changing the relations of production. Okay, so we are going today hit upon chapter nine, the social average, working hour as the basis of consumption. Who wants to stick up their hand to do some dirty reading? Who do we have here? I can do it, Tom. Good man. Let's try it then, Alex. Okay. Section A, consumption as a function of production. Although the labour movement has already done very little to study the laws of movement of communist production, a much greater fog hangs over the relationship of producers to social consumer goods. This is not surprising, however. It was precisely the great progress in understanding the interrelationships of economic life that Marx illustrated how production, distribution and consumption are not independent of each other, but that they determine their forms mutually. It, therefore, seemed superfluous, utopian, and thus unscientific to take a closer look at the subject of communist consumption. The scientific way of thinking was, therefore, very primitive from our present perspective. So the question was posed like this. The proletarian revolution brings the means of production into the ownership of the community, and thus we enter the communist operational life. Then, however, the laws of motion for individual consumption must absolutely necessarily be in accordance with them, precisely because they are inseparably connected with the laws of motion of production. With the transition to communist operational life, this matter, therefore, regulates itself. In fact, this is absolutely right. Only the transition to common ownership of the means of production does not necessarily lead to the communist operational life. There is an undeniable urge to stay capitalist, and with its implementation, consumption is regulated by the laws of movement of state capitalism. Okay, let's stop there. In a nice little uh, section. So, one of the reasons was they're saying that the idea that once we brought everything under common ownership, the laws of motion of that society would let themselves be known and communism was by definition things being brought under common ownership but not so quick that that has turned out to be incorrect that the laws of motion of purely just taking things into communist ownership turned out to be the laws of motion of what they like to call state capitalism or what whatever we want to call it i i think this is undoubtedly correct does anybody have any comment here on that uh let's keep going alex you good to read yeah, the next yeah, bit. Sure. Section B, the task of the revolution. This is typically expressed by the representatives of, let's say, state communism. They do not think of establishing a fixed relationship between producer and product. They do not want the worker to determine his relationship to the social product directly through his work, even if this would exclude any exploitation, in spare quotes, and prevent any guardianship of a government. Rather, they wanted to depend on the masters who dispose of the production apparatus and the product, how much the worker receives from the social product. They will pursue a pricing policy, i.e. they will set the prices for products and they will also conclude collective agreements with the trade unions to fix wages. 
How important is it that the workers become aware of the plans that are in the minds of the masters who hope to lead the communist economy, economy tomorrow may become clear from our following considerations. It shows how absolutely necessary it is to fight to make the exact relationship between producer and product the demand of the revolution. Section C, the consumption money. The aim of the revolution is the real abolition of the wage. The social revolution that abolishes wage labor must regulate the relationship of the workers to the social product on new bases. In other words, individual consumption must be organized according to new principles. The abolition of wage labor has the immediate effect of abolishing the wage. Communism does not know a wage. Here, there are only the interconnected producers who struggle together against nature to produce consumer goods and then distribute them equally among themselves. Setting working hours as a measure of consumption is nothing more than a technically necessary measure to be able to consume and produce according to plan. The technical organization of consumption, therefore, requires that workers in the factory receive a work certificate indicating how many hours they have given to society. These work certificates, or Owen's term, labor money, or these consumption certificates or consumption money are therefore only an indication of the consumer goods that the workers can freely obtain from the social stocks. Quote from Marx, on this point, I will only say further, as Owen's labor money, for instance, is no more money than a ticket for the theater. The certificate of labor is merely evidence of the part taken by the individual in the common labor and of his right to a certain portion of the common produce destined for consumption. Okay, so this is interesting because this week in on the Discord, some people have been posting some various critiques that have been made about this book from people over the years. I think usually it's over the from the first edition. One of them was using kind of Marx's critique of labor money in the Proudhon sense. So Proudhon's idea for labor money, and thus saying Marx was totally against the ideas of labor money put forward in the critique for the Gotha program and in Capital uh, and elsewhere. So like, there's a distinction between what Marx was critiquing of Proudhon and what Marx was putting forward here. In Proudhon's kind of solution was that if I worked at you know making a shoe and it took me two hours, I would put the amount of labor time on it and it would go in the market as two hours. But if somebody was way faster at me and they did it in one hour, it would be in the shop at one hour as well. So what would happen is that my labor, my, my labor price in this instance was my individual labor price. But on the market, because they weren't getting rid of market relations, it would not sell at that. It would You would see the contradiction between individual concrete labor time and the socially necessary labor time. So it was not a solution. So they had to basically try to fix the money form without fixing the relations of production. So I think it's quite clear from what Marx has written in numerous places and angles as well that they they are not talking about a labor money in the Proudhon sense. You know, it's such a it's always a, the the thing of capitalist progressives from MMT just all the way down. It's just the latest version or in America what they were always going on about the green back and by meta, metallism and everything that they, you, you think you will solve the injustice of the world by focusing on the money form, but not focusing on the productions of relations. So uh, I just thought that was an important thing to say there. Anybody else have anything to say on this little section then? I, I mean, I'd agree that Owen's labor money isn't money. And, and Marx isn't very clear as to why. I mean, I, as I understand Owen's money, you, that's money you could buy in Owen's company store. Yeah. So it's not exchangeable for, for general stuff, just like a ticket to the theatre. It's only good to get into the theatre and, and not for anything else. But this this comes, the, that quote comes from, I think, the beginning of chapter three, uh, volume one of Capital. So like where Marx has been going through like long-winded stuff about the origin of money that I think is frankly just wrong and unimportant to the, the, the rest of Capital. I mean, in, in David Harvey's, I mean, for all David Harvey's faults, but in his uh, presentation of that chapter, you know, he, he notes that that you know it, it's completely a- ahistorical how you know Marx views the, the origin of money, and you know, which is understandable because Donny is really it was widely known then. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think I would have argued with, with Marx that labour money is money. Well, or at least I pinned him down why he thought it's not. 
uh, I'll send you, if you want, a very, very good, I've just read yesterday, were lots of uh, Marx arguments about the stuff from mm-hmm. numerous different texts about why he says it's not money. But uh, yeah, that'd be interesting. I, I'll send it to you. It's really, really very, very sure. well written uh, article by a guy called David Adam on Marx's critique of socialist labor money schemes and the myth of council communism's prudonism. So it's it's really excellently written. So I I, I recommend that, and I yeah. probably best we um go from there. Like um because he does actually give those arguments. I think you're looking for, but you know they're not explicitly in capital. The other thing I would say in capital is that Marx is not given a historical argument for for in those first chapters he's he's given more of a logical argument oh, he's not like giving dates to, but he's given like some idea of how some commodity becomes the unit of account he was probably going off like the work that was available at the time but he doesn't explicitly say it has to be this it's more of a logical argument about you know relative and equivalent forms but anyway yeah. let's keep oh, let's keep going currency, fair currencies wouldn't fit into that scheme at all i don't think and uh, okay, at the time, gold was the the you know the basis of currency. But earlier than that, it had just been fair currencies. That's true. But it, the yeah. history of money is a switch between the forms. Yes, in reality. Yeah. You know, I'm not um, sure. Yeah, I don't know to what extent he knew that. Okay, who wants to read the next section then, Patrick? D. The consumption money by Lechner. But if two people say the same thing, it's far from the same. Lechner reaffirms this old wisdom. In his production apparatus, with working time calculation, he also introduces the labor money for individual consumption, thus creating the impression that work would be the yardstick for consumption. But this is by no means the case. In in his image of society, as in capitalism, workers are paid according to the value of their labor power. He uses the word labor money only to disguise capitalist wage relations. Very silly, he says. In truth, the image of society presented here is based on the idea of the allocation of goods in natura in proportion to the work done by each individual. Labor money is only a form of assignment of of the share of the national product chosen for economic, technical reasons. It seems Lechner is saying, the same thing as Marx here, but in reality, there's a poisonous snake in the grass. This is reflected in Lechner's particular view of the work done by each individual. For him, this means the capitalist wage relation must be maintained, and he uses the term labor money only to disguise the perpetuation of wage relations. Producers do not get back as many working hours for consumer goods as they have given to society. Still, rather than consumption, is regulated according to the standards that have nothing to do with the calculation of working hours. But what are these standards? The nutritional physiologists determine how many and which foods in a way represents the subsistence minimum with which the normal scientifically calculated and balanced life ration is determined. And that, that is the basis for the payment. What does this have to do with the calculation of working hours in production? The minimum is then for the unskilled workers, while the wage of the skilled and semi-skilled workers are set somewhat higher by collective agreements. Collective agreements determine the basic wage, while the socialist factory management sets the wage for the individual workers according to their ability. It's clear that producers can, can never feel their, their company as part of themselves if there are such opposites between them. They can therefore never bear the responsibility for the course of production, which is also not what state communists intend. In Lechner's case, therefore, it is, it is not the producers themselves who are responsible, not the company organization as whole, but the director. He says that any appointed manager of the operational unit bears personal responsibility for him, he can be re- removed without further ado, just like a capitalist manager who does not meet the demands placed on him. He will then only receive the minimum income guaranteed by society if he is unemployed or he will be used in a correspondingly lower and therefore worse paid position. In this way, the so-called private initiative of capitalist managers and directors 
and their sense of responsibility, which is also based on their personal interests, can, can be replaced and preserved for the socialist economy. It speaks for, for Lechner to, to call it one of the most severe punishments when someone is brought to the subsistence level on a nutritional basis. Okay, thanks for that, Patrick. Yeah, so there we, we see this whole idea of keeping the differential wage, keeping the manager. The class game becomes trying to secure yourself positions whereby you can secure higher wages. It's just by definition a return to a class society. You know, somebody was saying, I don't know if it was in my interview with Zoe Baker in Pack, and she was saying, you know, like that what happened in uh, the Spanish Revolution when there started to become hierarchic a boss uh, managers in the workplace again, that it, it, it really killed a lot of the revolutionary potential. And I, I remember reading Orwell's homage to Catalonia, and he said the same thing, you know, that the actual energy in the society was totally dissipated when they started reintroducing uh, managerial skills and stuff. I think that was more when the, you know, the Stalinist kind of Marxists got to, to command control of, of, of things and reintroduce the hierarchy. So, you know, I, I think that's undoubtedly correct. Let's read this a little bit here. Collective agreements determine the basic wage, while the socialist factory manager, inverted commas, sets the wage for the individual workers according to their ability. What happened to communism eat from each according to their ability, each to, from their needs? Not exactly clear. It is clear that producers can never feel the company as part of themselves if there are such opposites between them. They can therefore never bear the responsibility for the course of production, which is also not what the state communists intend. You know, I think the experience as well that Michael Albert, from who does the Paricon, was talking about very similar stuff that happened in Argentina post the 2000 collapse, that there was a lot of worker management firms started up when the capitalists basically left the production and the factories empty. The workers took them over, but the hierarchy quickly came back in and it really scuppered the life out of everything. I think there wasn't so much even to do with the wage. It was more to do with the types of work. Okay, who wants to read the next bit then? The Wage by Leichter. Chris, how do you feel? The Wage by Leichter. Although it is clear from the explanations that wage labor is the cornerstone of Leicester's socialism, we will examine wages more closely. To this end, however, it is also necessary to draw attention to pricing policy. One can believe that at least here, the socially average production time should be considered the price of products, but this is by no means the case. Leicester is very dark on this point, but it is nevertheless clear that the producers enter society in exchange for a higher price. He speaks, for example, of the profit, which, however, does not go to the company, but to the general treasury, Russia. These profits are then used by the general treasury to provide the funds for the expansion of the operational units. This profit fund is thus shown as an accumulation fund. We will come back to the accumulation later. But now we notice that the socially average working time in this production apparatus with working time calculations does not find its expression in the prices of the products either. The truth is that production management undermines the prices as it considers it useful and necessary. Thus, it carries out a price policy. Thus, capitalist wage relations are irrevocably restored. As we know, Marx's economy knows three categories of capitalist production in relation to the wage. One, the nominal wage. Two, the real or actual wage. And three, the relative wages. The nominal wage is the money price of labor power. In nutritional communism, this is understood to mean how many hours the workers paid, for example, 40 actual hours of work. The real wage is the quantity of product that can be realized for the nominal wage. Although the nominal wage can remain the same, the real wage becomes higher when the prices of the products fall. For example, falling prices in an economic crisis act as a wage increase for those with fixed income. Although their wages remain the same, their real wages increase. 
With the start of a new production cycle, prices usually rise again, thus reducing the real wages of those with fixed income. In Leister's vision of society, the central management pursues a price policy, naturally, in the interest of the consumers. But this does not change the fact that in reality, IT determines the real wage. I think that's oh, just uh, it. it. Sorry, yeah, yeah it. <laughs> IT. <laughs> Chris, fuck's sake. Yeah. You're a hundred yeah. years ahead of yeah. it. Yeah, I'm a little bit ahead of this. <laughs> I thought, wait, is, that, is this some uh, uh, initialism I, we haven't encountered yet? Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, it determines the real wage despite all collective agreements, which can only refer to the nominal wage. Producers and consumers may have a say in this pricing policy through democracy, but the actual conditions, the real pricing policy, are nevertheless determined by the masters of statistics. The relative wage is the ratio of the real wage to the entrepreneurial profit. Thus, for example, the real wage may remain the same while the relative wage decreases because of the profit increases. In this social image, Leister places the greatest emphasis on the rationalization of the operational units, i.e. on more productivity, i.e. the creation of more products in the same or shorter working hours. The socially average time required to manufacture products is thus constantly decreasing. However, the factual relationship between producer and product is not fixed in things as Leister. Leister only knows working machines with intelligence that are nourished on a nutritional physiological basis, which does not need to be fed extra calories as the product mass they create increases. Perhaps the workers also receive some of the greater wealth but there's not the slightest security for this. Thus, it is shown that the introduction of the category of socially average working hours in operational life is pointless if we do not, at the same time, take it as a basis for consumption. If the relationship of producers to the product is directly fixed in things themselves, then there is no room for price policy. Then the result of every improvement of the production apparatus directly falls automatically to all consumers without anyone assigning anything. What do you make of that, Chris? I'm going to have to take a minute to ruminate on it because it was pretty dense. Let's just say there was a, the, my favorite part of this. It's, it's, what did he call it? He had a really sick burn. Oh, nutritional communism. Oh, yeah. yeah, that, yeah that, was... that was a very sick burn. Here he goes. The nominal wage is the money price of labor power. In nutritional communism, this is understood to mean how many hours the worker is paid for, for example, 40 hours, actual hours of work. Like, I think it's kind of undoubtedly like kind of uh, what was done in the Soviet Union as well, you know, to maximize the amount of accumulation. They literally kind of calculated what would be the necessary nutritional minimum that people could survive on, particularly in the wartime. It's also the basis for wages, you know, the, uh, the minimum means of subsistence. So it's... Uh... In capitalism, value, yeah, it's the value um, of labor power, isn't it? Yeah, to reproduce itself, or or to just barely reproduce itself, or in some cases not at all, depending on the supply of labor from the countryside or wherever. <laughs> what we're seeing here then is that you know the, the three kind of forms uh, of wage: the nominal, the real, or actual wage, and the relative wages. Those three forms exist in capitalism, and they exist as well in what they call state communism. So. Once you have your price policy, you you end up with all of those three. Let's read this, just the last little section here. I think this sums it up. I know we keep having these same things, but if the relationship of producers... Oh, no, this is an important kind of slightly secondary point, like a second order effect. If the relationship of producers to the product is directly fixed in the things themselves, so, you know, the labor, amount of labor on the product is stamped on it as the, as the labor time price, then there is no room for a price policy. Then the result of every improvement of the production apparatus directly falls automatically to all consumers without anyone assigning anything. So like once that like bar of soap goes down from 60p to 54 pence, everybody benefits automatically straight away when they buy soap. It's not somebody, a bureaucrat somewhere saying, oh, well, maybe we should increase the number of soap bars we're going to give to people because they're a bit smelly. You know, these goddamn pros. It's like 
you know, these they're automatically passed on, and there is no there's no there's no intermediation. There's nobody between the product and and the consumer and deciding who goes where or how much they should get of this. So I think that's a real beauty of it. People see the immediate effect of increases. Yeah, as Max Macaroni says here, it makes the relations absolutely clear to everyone. Totally. It's it's crystal clear to everybody what's going on. We we are now more productive. There's less labor in these. We get more stuff or we work less. You know, it's crystal, crystal clear. Any other comments on this section? Yeah, a quick one on that paragraph you like. You go back to the one we're giving, uh, page 146, the normal wage. Is that not all over the place? So Yeah, I think you're right. But money price of labor power, but I would expect that to be in, say, pounds per hour. Yeah. Yeah. The wage is what I would say. If somebody said, What did you get paid? I got paid a hundred pounds. And here we have third unit, 40 actual hours. And I don't see what any of those have to do with nutritional communism. I mean, I, I think yeah. you can have nutritional communism with or without those things. I, I think that's all over the show. Yeah, I think you're right. When I read that, it, it, stri- it strikes me as it should be talked in, in money terms, not our terms. Yeah. Like it should say, you know, the nominal wage is eight dollars an hour, and you work forty, so your wage is three forty. But it doesn't and, say anything yeah, with the relation and, of money to the actual products. Yeah, and it yeah. doesn't necessarily have anything to do with nutritional communism. No, I think that's just a. He's just making a slight that they they will he's they just, will set yeah, the, he'll, really they good. will set yeah they'll set the nominal wage. Yeah. based upon what the price is of the cost of reproduction of, of the labourer. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I'd like that's something I'd get on to Herman about as well, because I think that is not clear. I, was, I, I actually meant to say that as well. That's a good spot, Alex. Alex Eagle Eye, that's what we're going to call him. Okay, I think we'll go on to communism in Soviet Hungary, the thing we are all so interested in. See, who, who wants to read here? Uh, macaroni, good. Communism in Soviet Hungary. Leichter is not the only one who seeks his salvation in pricing policy. On the contrary, it is the central point of all considerations of communist economic life. More important than all of these considerations, however, is practical experience. And that is why we want to examine more closely how the practice of pricing policy and communist operational life took place in Soviet Hungary. We do not take Russia as an example because this is not possible in such a limited space. In principle, however, it comes down to the same thing. In Economic Problems of the Proletarian Dictatorship, the former Soviet Hungarian People's Commissar Varga explained his experiences and theoretical considerations regarding the Hungarian Soviet Republic. For the study of communist economics, the history of Hungary is certainly important because here the theory of state communism was put into practice and practice into theory. In Hungary, communism was built according to the rules of the state communist art and probably under such favorable conditions that the transformation and organizational restructuring in Hungary were faster and more vigorous than in Russia. The country is much smaller and more densely populated, which made that a lot of things could be organized centrally that have to be decentralized due to the huge expanse of Russia. The construction took place according to Hilferding's vision of the general cartel. The state, as the general leader and administrator of production and distribution, had the full right of disposal of all products. That which was still produced in free capitalist enterprise was brought up by the state so that the state actually controlled the total product. Uh, The distribution of the means of production. If the managers have access to the entire social product, they must distribute it, first by making new means of production and raw materials available to the operational units. For this purpose, the Supreme Economic Council had set up various raw material centers, which then allocated as many raw materials, etc., to the operational units as they deemed useful and necessary. But these centers were by no means only distribution organs. They also functioned as political and economic means of power vis-a-vis the working class. These centers had to bring about the concentration of the factories, which was very simple, by simply cutting off factories which one wanted to bring to a standstill from above, from the supply of materials, which then caused the workforce of the factory to hit the pavement. It is obvious that the workers resisted such a concentration process, uh, which was just as fatal for them in its economic consequences as it was under capitalism. 
they were practically taught that the producers did not have the right of disposal over the production apparatus. This right rested with the state officials of the Supreme Economic Council, which came in irreconcilable irre opposition to the producers. We want to note that that concentration from above is probably faster than from below, but the price of this acceleration cost is the right of the producers to dispose of the production apparatus, i.e. communism itself. Okay, that's a banger of a last sentence. We want to note that concentration from above is probably faster than from below, but the price that this acceleration cost is the right of the producers to dispose of the production apparatus, i.e. communism itself. I, I think it's nearly impossible to argue with that point. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I, one of the things that really strikes me the most about this this whole text, and I know this is things that people have said before, is that you know it really just emphasizes like beginning, middle, and end, first and last, you know, A to Z, communism is the producers having real control over their labor. And, you know, then kind of teasing out the many ways in which that can be eroded or, or has been eroded by traditional ways of kind of implementing communism. And so like the whole description of the way that like the Hungarian Supreme Economic Council, you know, gets to just make decisions about what the economy is going to do by choking off economic units teaches the workers who work there like, oh, you know, holy crap, we actually don't have any real control here. And if you don't have real control here, like, again, as they say, like, it might be a great way of centralizing production. It might be a great way of, you know, increasing production capacity, but it has nothing to do with communism. I think there's so much of it is putting as well as putting supposed efficiency ahead of principle, expediency ahead of principle. You know, I know these things happen in real time and this stuff and it, it, it's it's difficult, but you can only assume it's incredibly difficult in the reality of the situations. But it seems like the underlying logic was very much focused in the wrong direction, I think. Like, what are you what are you going to what are you going to think about the communists if you're working in some like factory someplace and uh, a workers council are working in it or something? And then the communists just shut it down all of a sudden. Like, that's going to put you... <laughs> fundamentally against such a policy. And can somebody tell me here about Hungary at the time who might know, but like Hungary were an awful lot more developed than Russia at the time. I know they weren't super capitalist, but like what state was the Hungarian economy in at this time? Does anybody have any good historical knowledge on that? I've got like a very high level, like the main thing that I know about it was that they were dealing with the breakup of Austria-Hungary that had just recently happened that left like a huge amount of kind of like the economic equilibrium that Hungary kind of had existed within, you know, like the based off of the way that the Habsburgs kind of had been running the empire. When it broke up, all of a sudden, economic units that were dependent on resources coming in from, you know, different provinces of the empire or, you know, that were that relied on being able to send their products to different provinces of the empire for refinement, all of a sudden, just completely broke apart, because that whole system was just completely undone. And I know traditionally, the, the big Paeonian plane of, of Hungary was always like really like tended to be much more agricultural. And so when they, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, when when that happened, when like Trianon kind of like really split up the old kingdom of Hungary, it was kind of left in a place where what industry they had couldn't really function because most of like the the other parts in the supply chain that it had relied on were now in Czechoslovakia or Austria or Yugoslavia and were no longer part of the same kind of system that it could be in. And so they were really kind of just incredibly disorganized, just in the sense that like the the entire system had been broken apart. I was in uh, Hungary in about 2008 before I was ever into Marx and stuff like this. I just went into Railing one summer for a while. And like there was serious, you could see there was serious imperial wealth in uh, Budapest, real imperial wealth. So you'd wonder, because it was all of a large unit, a lot of it could have been, I suppose, flowing from the different areas into uh, it because it was was it the seat was it it was it or was it what's the capital it was Prague was Prague where the Habsburgs had actually had their seat uh, Vienna uh, Chris says after kind of like the the Hungarian revolution and like the change of the Austrian Empire into Austria Hungary there was kind of like a uh, an administrative center in Budapest that kind of represented the Hungarian half of the empire but I, I think it was still like the the imperial center was still Vienna. All those capital cities, like I've been to Prague, and that's pretty it's pretty nice stuff in Prague and Hungary. Uh, what else? Have I been to the other ones? In Austria, yeah, Austria is pretty spectacular as well. What do we think 
concentration from below means? What do you think their alternative is to this high-handed economic council? Because other than its behaviour, like shutting down factories, it sounds somewhat like the guild, you know, the sort of guild that we've like presumed the existence of so far. Yeah, I think you're right there. I think it's the council system uh, uh, and the, the higher levels of organisation, the guilds and that forming. But the thing as well is to say that in the revolution, before the revolution, the, that concept wasn't even really about so much. So I think, you know, they were saying that this would have had to have like evolved or sorted itself out. But I, I think in a future revolution, if you had your kind of experience from looking past through history, you could do it in a more efficient manner because you were planned beforehand what you want to do. Mac, do you want to respond there? Sure. Yeah. So uh, an example kind of, of of that kind of council system that I know Appel and the, the GIC would have been familiar with would have been the German General Workers Union or the AAUD. This was kind of like the organization, like the, the economic organization that the KAPD, the, the Communist Workers Party, the left communists in Germany set up kind of like on the basis of looking at the IWW kind of as an example of like, this is how you would network together a bunch of factory councils into a whole like nationwide, region-wide like council system that was capable of making those kinds of economic decisions, making those kinds of political decisions and, you know, subverting the the isolation of individual economic units by plugging them into each other. And and like the, the AAUD ended up kind of withering with the rest of like the left communist projects as the revolutionary tide in Germany turned back. But it was something that like, you know, Rula spent a lot of time theorizing about and working with in, in his own version. Gorder and Panikok spent a lot of time kind of like developing the ideas of like what was the relation between like the KAPD and the AAUD. But it was it was essentially like a, a method of like how do we how do we structure and organize an economy with the workers you know, like with power at, at as low of a position in relation to the workers as possible. And so like it was kind of like their practical attempt at, at solving that problem of like, you know, how do you do this from below? Are there any good books on that stuff? Yeah, so I I just read a really, really interesting one by John Gerber. I think I actually posted it in the, the Discord called Anton Panikok and the Socialism of Workers' Self-Emancipation. Um, that kind of, it's mostly a political kind of biography of Panikok, but kind of also lays out the, the the entirety of the kind of like left communist, council communist sphere that he came from. But then also specifically, I think it's actually at the end of, I, I don't remember if it's uh, Otto Rula's The Revolution is Not a Party Affair, or if it is his From Bourgeois uh, to Proletarian Revolution. But at the end, there's like, he, he includes like, this is the organizational structure for the AAUD. And and he had like his own whole view where like he ended up breaking away from the KAPD and, and pushing for what he called the unitary organization, the, the AAUDE, which was basically like, you know, no more parties. We're done with parties. All my homies hate parties. And we're just going to we're just going to do it through the industrial union and like the council union. But uh, he, he also because that was such a, a big part of kind of like what he focused on and what he was interested in, he ended up incorporating a lot of like descriptions of that kind of stuff into the rest of his work. Very good. Donald, do you fancy this then? Okay. So, H, the pricing policy in Hungary. Turning now to the area of consumption, it should be noted that Varga is basically in favor of an even distribution of the product. This distribution would take place in kind, without a unit of account. However, Varga points out that the workers themselves initially rejected an even distribution of the social product, and that we must consider a, quote, generation of workers corrupted by capitalism and educated in a greedy, egotistic ideology, end quote. We are familiar with this ideology, which makes the skilled look contemptuously at the unskilled, while at the same time it runs counter to the legal sense that the holders of the intellectual professions, such as doctors and engineers, should not receive a larger share of the social product. There is a certain conviction that the difference is too great today, but a doctor is not a garbage collector. The extent to which the workers change this ideology, the course of the revolution remains to be seen. So much is certain that this change must take place quickly after the revolution because an unequal distribution of the product always leads to disputes within the working class itself. For the distribution of the products, the rations for each product were now fixed, 
which could then be purchased in the cooperatives. Quote, but since for the time being, there are still wages and prices of money, end quote, we must now turn to the problem of, quote, the state fixing the prices, end quote. Varga first states the solution in principle, which, however, could not be applied. This is formulated as follows, quote, how high should the price of state products be set? If the state produced goods were sold at cost price, there would be no income left to maintain the above mentioned unproductive strata of the population. This refers to soldiers, civil servants, teachers, unemployed, sick, invalids. There would also be no possibility of a real accumulation of means of production, which is even more urgently needed in the proletarian state for the purpose of raising the standard of living of the inhabitants than in the capitalist state. In principle, therefore, all state goods must be sold at social cost price. By this, we mean the cost price plus a supplement sufficient to cover the maintenance costs of the non-working people, plus a supplement to enable real accumulation, highlighting by Varga. In other words, the selling prices must be determined in such a way that not only does the state not have a deficit, but also a surplus to build new productive operations. This is the principal solution, end quote. We will look at this principal solution later. We will only point out now that it is not possible to determine the social production costs so that a normal pricing policy was applied. In other words, an indirect tax was imposed on various products. No doubt, Varga wants the pricing policy to be class politics, privileging the working class. Why he wants to tax the products that are of primary importance to the workers, such as bread and sugar, little, but the luxury products highly. However, he attaches more propagandistic than economic importance to the difference in taxation, because he knows very well that the enormous sums which the state devours must ultimately come from the masses, i.e. from the proletariat. This class politics, however well-intentioned it may be, reveals the whole rottenness of the state communist distribution. It demonstrates very clearly that the producer, with his work, has not at the same time determined his share of the social product, but that this share is determined in the higher regions by personal decision. Thus, the old political struggle for government posts is continued in a new form. It is clearly shown that whoever has political power in the state also controls the entire social product and through price policy controls the distribution of national income. It is the old struggle for positions of power that is being fought on the backs of the consumers. If we add to this the fact that wages are also determined by the Supreme Economic Council, then the picture of state communist mass slavery is complete. The central management of production has it entirely in its hands to immediately nullify a forced wage increase through its pricing policy. It is thus evident that in the construction of state communism, the working class creates a production apparatus that rises above the producers and thus grows into an apparatus of subjugation that is even more difficult to fight than capitalism. This relationship between the rulers and the ruled finds its concealment in the democratic forms of the distribution organizations. In Russia, a decree was issued on the 20th of March, 1919, which obliged the entire Russian population to form consumer cooperatives. All these cooperatives, which have their own mobility within their spheres of activity, were then forged into an organic whole. At the same time, the consumers determined the course of distribution by holding meetings and congresses. They were masters of their own house. Although the state was the stimulating force behind the formation of the cooperatives and mergers, once the organization was established, the distribution of the product was left to the people themselves. According to the Russian correspondence, this organizational work of the state should have brought about the enormous distribution apparatus within five months. This much is certain that the Communist Party, dictatorship in Russia has done a tremendous job in this respect and has set a shining example of how consumers can set up their distribution apparatus in a short time. But if consumers are already masters of their own house, the question of what communism is all about, namely determining the relationship between producers and the product, is still not decided there. This decision is made in the central government offices. 
Consumers are then allowed to distribute the product independently, but according to the standards set by the pricing policy. Okay, so there's loads of really good stuff in this, I think. It demonstrates very clearly that the producer, with his work, has not at the same time determined to share the social product, but that this share is determined in the higher regions by personal decision. Thus, the old political struggle for government posts is continued in a new form. Okay, and it, it, they go on further. It is clearly shown that whoever has political power in the state also controls the entire social product and through price policy controls the distribution of national income. It is the old struggle for position of powers that has been fought on the backs of the consumers. It goes on to say, it is thus evident that in the construction of state communism, the working class creates a production apparatus that rise above the producers and thus grows into an apparatus of subjugation that is even more difficult to fight than capitalism. You know, I think that's undoubtedly, I don't know if it's undoubtedly true, but it's definitely true that it, it formed an apparatus that what seemed to be as difficult to fight as capitalism. Are you right to say it's more difficult? So something that this kind of strikes as being interesting to me is like, this is a very similar argument to something that Paul Maddock argues for in the book Anti-Bolshevik Communism. I think it's in the essay Bolshevism and Stalinism, where he's describing the ways in which Soviet economic policy began to be kind of used as a method of like power struggle amongst the new elite within the party. So like, you know, one group of people are starting to argue for the factory councils while the other ones are arguing for the peasants or one are arguing for the international parties. And like the, the, the vehicles that are supposed to be you know, either tools of the working class to defend itself or to advance a socialist economy or to organize itself end up becoming like within this, that, that framework, Maddox argument, like they kind of become part of this court battle that's happening in the Politburo or court battle that's happening in, in the, the, the inner sanctums of the party as like different people are jockeying for power. And to me, one of the things that's really dangerous about this is is that it makes it harder to really see what is going on when those kinds of tools are being used in the names of the producers by people who claim to be representing the producers but who are really representing kind of their own relational class power or their own relational like you know role in the state and it it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like divorce like diffused spectacle right like you know it's it's a society in which you you can't really ground yourself as much anymore in like what is actually happening um and that that strikes me as being like a lot harder to like the the advantage of the the capitalism that the you know the bolsheviks and the the russian revolution was overthrowing was that it was it was very in your face it was very brutal it was very you know inhuman and so therefore it's relatively easy to be like oh yeah you know we can we can stand in in opposition to that it's a lot harder when the people who are undercutting you and exploiting you and and subjecting you to you know the, the kind of mass slavery style forced labor that, that they're describing here are doing it in the name of the working class and in the name of building communism that seems to just be like a real a real wrench in terms of like allowing workers or producers to figure out like okay where what direction is up yeah it, it makes the it makes it harder to find your opposition it's just a pr nightmare for people to work against Donald, were you going to say something there? Yeah, if I could just come back in for a second. I, I just feel like maybe some of this stuff kind of, maybe it's important, but I think it, it it misses the mark a little bit in the sense that there's a lot of emphasis being put on here, the the idea of that there's now new rulers and ruled. And I think that that, that gets away from the central point. Like, I mean, the, the central point that they were making before was that you can't have communism piecemeal, that if, if any of it is not determined by a kind of direct circuit between producers and consumers, then you have no choice but to either assign production and consumption subjectively by committee, and then you have to force consumption to fit into the production schedule that you've arbitrarily made up, or else allow you know the, the capitalist value form to, to control the circuit indirectly. But what they're talking about now seems to me to be kind of more a uh, kind of moral objection to the idea that maybe moral is the wrong word, but a kind of an objection outside of that to the idea that now we have a new ruling class, which I think that gets away from the point. I think Lenin and even I'm sure in Hungary as well, they did think that they were doing communism. They didn't think that they were going to, or we're going to get rich by doing this. You know, that to me, that kind of seems maybe 
a little bit outside the main point that they're trying to make here. That it's the the main point is that you actually can't achieve communism doing this. You know that it's at odds. Like its organizational method is at odds with the end goal. You know, to me. Yeah, I agree. But I, I also think though that Donald that there is a kind of a. You know, you can get into any left-wing organization you want, like a commie, an anarchist, or whatever what it is. And individual personality types, I think, play a role, as in, like, people who want to control. And I, I do think people have a desire for for things that are outside of money. Like, people have a desire for pure, for pure power as well. So I, I think there is an element of, you know, meet the, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, that plays into... I think that plays into the politics that, you know, people want control of other people's lives, even in the name of communism. I don't know if I'm overstating that, but I do feel like that. Like if you look today at the different types of people that find themselves in different types of organizations, I think you would be able to uh, do some interesting psychological analyses uh, of the various sects and uh, small left-wing parties. I don't know if people are going to call me some kind of a uh, positivist, but uh I think there's something to it. I think it's more they're making the secondary point. You know, I think it is an important secondary point, if not the principal argument of the book. But I don't know. Are we good to go on the next one? Let me see. Fair distribution. Maybe I'll read this bit myself. Is this the last one? I. Fair distribution. In communist production, on the other hand, we demand that working time be the measure of consumption. Every worker determines through his work at the same time his share in the social stock of consumer goods. Or as Marx says, he receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labour after deducting his labour for the common funds. And with this certificate, he draws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labour cost. The same amount of labour which he has given to society in one form, he receives back in another This is misinterpreted as a just distribution of the social product, and no one can indeed eat with idleness just as shareholders collect dividends. But that's the end of justice. At first glass, it seems very fair that all wage differences should be eliminated and that all functions in social life, whether mental or manual, should be given equal rights to the wealth of society. On closer inspection, however, this equal right functions very unfairly. Take two workers both of whom give their best to society. But one is unmarried while the other has a family with five children. Another is married while husband and wife both work so that they have double income. In other words, the equal right to social wealth becomes a great injustice in practical consumption. The distribution of goods according to the measure of working time can therefore never be derived from equity. The same imperfections stick to the measure of working time as to any other measure. That is to say, There is no fair standard, and it can never exist. Whatever measure is chosen, it must always be unjust. Because using a measure means ignoring the individual differences in needs. One has a few needs, the other has many. So, one can cover his needs with his assignments to the supplies, while the other has to deny himself all sorts of things. They give all their potential to society, and yet one can satisfy his needs, and the other cannot. This is the imperfection that is inherent in every measure. The application of a measure of consumption thus becomes an expression of the inequality of consumption. The demand for equal rights to social wealth, therefore, has nothing to do with justice. Rather, it is a political demand par excellence that we as wage earners make. For us, the abolition of wage labour is the central point of the proletarian revolution. As long as labour is not the measure of consumption, as long as there is a wage, it may be high or low. In any case, there is no direct link between the wealth of the goods produced and this wage. Therefore, the management of production, distribution of goods, and thus the surplus value created, must be transferred to the higher instances. If working time is the measure of individual consumption, this means nothing other than wage labour has been abolished, that there is no surplus value creation, and that therefore no higher instances are needed to distribute the national income. The claim to equal rights to social wealth is, therefore, in no way based on justice or any kind of moral evaluation. It is based on the conviction that this is the only way for workers to maintain control over operational life. It is on the injustice of equal rights that communism 
that that communist society begins to develop. Okay, like good Marxists, we don't make normative claims. <laughs> I, I I think Marxists go a bit a bit far in trying to eliminate kind of uh, moralism or normative kind of stuff from things. But like the most important thing here is that this is the only way that you can the workers can defend themselves from exploitation. Essentially, that's the most important thing. You know, this idea between like one person having five kids and the other having no, you know, to both of them working and all that, like that exists under capitalism and people don't say that's unfair. That's just people's life choices. So I think, I don't know what I'm saying here. Somebody come in, help me here. I'm struggling. <laughs> life choices, Tom. <laughs> yeah, like some people don't want to have kids. Some people want to have kids, yeah, no, for no, example. No, sure. <laughs> yeah, I think biology might have something to say about that, but... um also, the, uh, this seems to be valuing uh, raising children and housework at zero, saying that's unproductive labour and has no value, which I think a lot of people might have an issue with. I think in the kind of technical sense, it would be unproductive. But there is no reason why mothers can't be a GSU unit, okay? Yes. So, like, the fact that it's unproductive is, is not a reason for it not to have a wage, it's unproductive but, in the sense of not directly providing a service or creating a good, but it's productive in terms of like reproducing social, what, what do you call it? Oh, absolutely. I agree. I'm yeah. just talking in like that kind of yes, technical yes, Marxist sense. Yes. Yeah, it yes. produces producers. Thank you. Yeah. It, it produces producers. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there is definitely, uh, like, I remember my I was working and uh, kind of had this manager. He was a bright guy, but a, a terrible lib. And he, he said to me, um, Oh, I think, you know, you know, women should be paid to uh, raise the kids. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, at the time. But like, absolutely. Like, it is it is productive labor. Yes. It never struck me before. And like, like the, the setup here is is like literally the society can decide that. They could decide to give them a, the same wage as productive. It could be like a, a, a stipend. Anybody else? What do people think about this kind of uh, the moralism here? This a fear of moralism. Like, there's a distinct fear of, of like, trying to make communism a moral argument here. You know, this idea that the demand for equal rights to social wealth, therefore, has nothing to do with justice. Like, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Like, I don't yeah. know, like, about any of you, any of you, like, but, like, you're, you're intrinsically, me, I'm intrinsically attached to communism because of, like, the kind of moral and normative arguments. The fact that then there is a material theory behind it leading, you know, us to believe that it's it's not just purely a moral argument is like a for me is it, I think it's like a bonus. <laughs> but I think we're initially attracted to it for its moral. We we see the injustice. We're attracted for it for because of the because of the justice. Not because oh there's a material theory here that says it's right. Chris I think uh yeah maybe just socialists from this generation were pretty disgusted with um bourgeois hypocrisy that just hearing that sort of rhetoric was kind of made you made you wince a bit right sort of like the way a lot of you know socialists today will wince at sort of woke culture even if it's based in you know sound morality or or a sense of justice right and i i think that you you find that in definitely in marx and engels right they talk about bourgeois rights and you know or certainly lenin but, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater at the same time, you know, criticizing formal freedoms and formal rights and all this stuff. Yeah, this kind of seems I feel like this is something and, and I say this as a person who came to left politics, you know, through anarchism rather than through Marxism. And so, like, I, I always felt like there was kind of more of a emphasis on looking at things from like a, a moral perspective on the anarchist side. And then I was like, I don't have the kind of that doesn't get my hackles up in the same way that I know it does for some people who come more from like the traditional Marxist kind of perspective. But it always had kind of sem seemed to me that a lot of like the, the second international era was just very, very focused on this is, you know, it was like, that was the, the peak of like some really uh, overly deterministic, you know, views of how the revolution happens. And like, you know, we're, we're not doing the revolution because it's good to do. We're doing the revolution because it's inevitable. We're, you know, this is the inevitable thing that is, is, like the, the contradictions in capitalist society are producing and that's why we're doing this. And especially the later council communists ended up kind of developing a, a, a fairly heavy deterministic kind of like emphasis on crisis theory that 
would would definitely produce that kind of a like look we're 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 not doing putting this out because we think it's kind or good or nice to do but because this is the you know the inevitable march of history or something like that and so like i t- i'm i'm curious if this is like you know hey we're trying to we're trying to show that like the reason why we're we're saying this is because we don't have a moral critique of the the soviet union's like that's not what we're grounding this in we're grounding this in like we're grounding it in our math we're grounding it in our marks and we're grounding it in the same kind of like post second international Marxism that everyone else is operating in. But I'm, I, I could be way off base on that. It's interesting you say that, Matt, because you've obviously read a lot more of this council of communism stuff but uh, than, than I have for certain. I think last week or the week before, I was just editing some stuff where we were talking about, uh, he talked about like a value theoretic critique of Hilferding by uh, Grossman in The Law of Accumulation and Breakdown of the Capitalist System. And like in that, he's kind of like a kind of a, catastrophist kind of thing where you know it's all going down 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 and eventually we'll have this mega crisis which i don't think is marxist like is that does that become like a dominant position like of this kind of breakdown theory in the cancer communists that you've read um yeah especially kind of in the later the later phase right if you if you were to track like there's kind of a the council communists all really kind of come out of like the the left radical tradition within the spd and like the the dutch social democrats then kind of split off to become the KAPD, then that kind of breaks down and it's the GIK. And then after that, it's kind of like the tradition that's kind of more in the hands of like Paul Matic and Karl Korsch. And later on, they get very, very focused on that like crisis theory, the crisis is coming. And like, that's also a big part of what leads them to develop these really in-depth analyses of like monopolization and like you know the the tendency towards state capitalism like right they had a a whole a a lot of a lot of ink spent on describing like the ways in which like the fascist corporate economic model the soviet state capitalist model and the you know american english free even the free market model was still tending towards monopoly capitalism because in all of those kinds of situations like the the age of the dynamic free market capitalism was done and capital was girding itself against these crises by in all three of those situations developing towards these like monopolistic concentrated centralized economic systems and so that becomes like a really really big focus of them um and like that's where like i I don't have as much of a a strong grounding in in the basis of like growth like i haven't read grossman and i don't really i'm I'm still slowly working my way through capital (laughs) and so like a lot of that kind of stuff is, is is stuff where i I don't have as much of like the understanding of like the the argument itself, but I kind of have like a view of more of more of like the meta argument that we're kind of you know engaging with around it. When you say uh, Mac, uh, the, in the later on, what years are you talking about? So that's like through the forties and or like forties uh, and fifties. So like the uh, after World War II, um, like during World War II, the Netherlands gets occupied. Panacoke basically, you know, keeps his head down working in astrology, like the the astronomy field. Um, and a lot of like the GIK just doesn't come back to organize political work. There are a couple of groups that attempt to establish kind of like council communist, either like, you know, theoretical circles or things like that. But basically, after the Nazis were pushed back in Europe, especially a lot of that kind of council communist tradition kind of like the the people who had been involved in it were disconnected from each other. They were kind of burned out. They didn't really think that it was a a huge value in moving forward. So I think like at that at this point, Matic and Korsh were both in America. Matic, you know, had a council communist group that he had been working with in the 40s and he kind of moved away from that. And so for a large part, that kind of that tradition really kind of like goes dormant until those ideas are later picked up again by CLR James and like socialism, I can, sorry, my French is terrible, but like socialism and barbary um, and like castriatus. And it's not really until socialism or barbarism starts their their letter writing with Panacoke in, I think it's in the 60s where like, or no, no, he died in 60s. So in the 50s when, you know, that old original council communism current, like actually has a dialogue again with like the, the new people in the 50s and the 60s who are starting to kind of re-embrace those ideas. So like council communism makes up like part of one of the threads that get weaved into like the situationists, the economists, a lot of those kinds of like dissident Leninist, dissident communist traditions that ended up happening in the 60s, and 70s. But most of the original people who had been involved, you know, kind of get burned out on politics, like on political organizing by the 40s. 
Yeah, I, I think I read somewhere that like Appel was uh, Jan Appel was kind of involved in the '68 thing in France. I, I I saw something somewhere that like he might have been given lectures or something around that time there. Yeah, that thanks for that, Mac. That's really really good detailed stuff. Okay, so that's the end of today. So we next week we are going to be doing j- uh, chapter ten. So this is this is a bit of a banger. The, this is going to get into our formulas for the basically the communist tax so this is going to be our fic we're going to do the basic fic and then he does some uh, mixed operational units ones so this is uh really good stuff here now we're going to get into and cool thanks everybody for coming and sure we'll see you all next week <laughs>